Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the Cypher System rules by Monty Cook Games. This actual play is performed by adults and contains adult themes. We're happy to have you with us on this journey of cosmic wonder. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and etc., which may bear resemblance to entities living from the vast reaches of unknown space, are strictly coincidental. My name is Michael Diamond, and for tonight's game, I will be your Game Master. Thank you for joining us again on another episode of the Old Ways Podcast. I am your Game Master this evening, Michael Diamond. My pronouns are he, him, and we are back with our Children of the Periphery story subtitled Into the Unknown, Season 2, Episode 2. We'd like to thank both our listeners and especially our Patreon supporters, all of you wonderful people who are helping us do what we do. If you'd like to check out what we have to offer on Patreon and the many, many fun times we have over there, do so at patreon.com slash the old ways podcast. Make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube and go see us on Twitch, twitch.tv slash the old ways Twitch, where you may possibly in the future see some of the voices and the actual bodies of the people who create this game on our Twitch channel. I will leave now to introductions before it gets creepy to my right. This is Morgan. I play Captain Amara Kasra, and it already did get creepy. Yeah, season, um, the, the opener was a, a little strange. You learned some things about some friends and where they've gone or maybe where they're not going. To the captain's right. Hi, this is Rena. I play Tamara Scanvari. Our pronouns are they, them. And I feel like things are changing. Indeed they are. As they say, changes. They do happen at the end of the table. Hi, my name is Mare, and I am playing a Lieutenant Colonel Cordelia Oren. And I'm very happy to be here, very happy to help. Everything's going to be great. Mm, I like that positive attitude. And last, most certainly not least. Hi, this is John. I'll be playing Fida, a mechanical explorer who talks to machines and is definitely not panicking about the Legionnaire that has told him over the radio she is going to come up to the bridge. Also, we both use he, him pronouns. Oh, fantastic. So when last we left, there was a series of radio transmissions that came from the bridge that got picked up by a certain lieutenant colonel who happens to be a member of the Legionnaires and who happens to be somewhat coincidentally in the cargo bay. And she's decided that it would be just right and proper to head right back up to the bridge, which I'm sure for our third Horizoners had no amount of anxiety or trepidation at the idea of what is likely someone coming up in power armor to see them. Look, Captain, this is someone that uh, kind of picked, so I don't... I think they're probably on the level. At least their record is. Hasn't Kynot done things in the past that were considerably harmful to you personally, Fida? He, like, looks at his hands that are basically just solid black with ink, and he's like, I mean, yes, but I never died. That's not exactly reassuring. Fair. I don't actually don't know. I don't have any consolation. I'm going to go look at this monitor over here and see if I can see what's wrong with the engine. See why we don't have power. I, for one, am a person where somebody has to earn my trust and loyalty, so you guys didn't earn it overnight. To be fair, Captain, I still don't even trust you, but that's just me. You head over to the um, some of the system panels, Vida, to get a better idea of what, well, frankly, what all the voices that these things keep, all the, all the voices, that, the machines that are chattering at you, trying to get you to pay attention to them. Because, of course, that none of that went away. It's been just sitting in the background now. Yeah, it's basically white noise for me at this stage, because I don't know the ship well enough if I listen to one it makes sense but if I try and put them all together I don't understand it just yet I need to get a bit more familiar with how this thing's put together and how these different systems actually interrelate I love that idea for you I'm going to say that to get uh, your bearings based on the size of the ship and the amount of information it is a challenge rating of 4 to get the information out of it. So that would normally mean 12 or more on a D20. Now, we we're, we know a couple things about FIDA. One of the things that we know is that he's trained in many of those mechanical or computer skills, but give us a run through again of what the actual verbiage is. Mm-hmm. So 
We can use my machine affinity special ability, where I am trained in tasks involving electrical machines. This is an, enab an enabler class. Right now, I don't think I'm going to use distant interface because I don't see the benefit to that. I can activate or deactivate or control a machine at long range with my brain uh, because of, well, certain factors from last season. Uh, I can also make machines do things other than their original purpose in a pinch. Okay, and so to make sure folks who are listening understand when we play the Cypher system, an ability has, a special ability has the subtext in it that says that it's an enabler, right? Some special abilities are going to allow you to perform a familiar action, one that you can already do in a different way, right? So using one of these abilities is not considered an action. And so it's important that if for whatever reason we ever get into something that maybe is, say, combat related, Fida using that ability doesn't cost him an action to do. Yeah, it's uh, just part of how my brain works now. From my background, I am mechanical and I talk to machines. So these two things work together in a big way for me in terms of dealing with all these different things that we have on the ship. Okay, so that'll take the difficulty from four to three. And so that's now nine or better. Is there anything else you would like to apply to it? Looking at my character sheet, I have tools to deal with these things, but I'm like, for look, if for dealing with an interface, I think that's going to be, I'm not going to try and use my, uh, a continuity tester isn't going to help me with inputting on a computer. No, but you could spend effort if you needed to. That's true. So that could come out of your like, intellect pool. And you could spend three points of pool to drop that difficulty from a three to a two, and then it's six or better. Um, and then if you have an edge in your intellect pool, it doesn't actually cost you three, it costs you two. So, yep, those are your options. You know what? I'm going to spend the three intellect. Uh, I don't have any edge in intellect. I have it in might okay. because I only have it from being an explorer. But uh, I will spend from 13 down to 10 to get okay. to knock it down to um, challenge rating two. Yeah, great. So, so, so six or better. Yep. And that's a seven. Boy. Which, uh, oh boy. <laughs> good, good thing, huh? Really lucky that you spent that pool. Okay. So... For a good couple minutes, Fida reassesses this, we'll just say a couple centuries old technology, and you come away with a couple of very important things. One, the bridge has a, a slightly different interface at the helm that looks like, like a piece of middleware. It bridges the gap between technology that you would remember from the Third Horizon and interfaces with this sort of original spacefaring piece, which is great. Immediately, the biggest concern Fida has when he sees it and begins working with it is, what if this breaks down? What if I have a problem? There's no way to replace this. Yeah, this is something Altain must have put together so he could use the ship. You bet. You bet. Yeah, I'm like, I don't have any of the parts to, to replace that. I could maybe extend its life. I could not completely resurrected. No, probably not. But you do get to see that there there is this seed, this colony ship that named the periphery. You get the uh, wire drawing, like the wireline readout of the frame itself. You can tell that it has been modified from what it originally was composed to carry. And you can also tell that a vast majority of the ship is not powered on. There's no lighting. There's very little environmental controls. You're concerned about vast swaths of the ship that are essentially without life support. And the biggest concern you have, at least by looking at what you see from the readout, is there is a limited amount of cargo that is considered consumables. And that means the clock is ticking. Mm -hmm. And uh, as soon as I see that the consumables are a factor, I have flashbacks to the smell from that one fire and also the huge mob that we encountered and the guy with the homemade microwave gun. And I'm just like, that's uh, that's going to need to be rectified more or less immediately. But first, power. I can do something about power. Yeah, um, at this point, you can sort of look at the readout, which tells you that the main drive is offline. So the main generator is not currently pushing power to the rest of the ship, which makes sense why nothing is powered on. 
Yeah. Makes sense why everything's on emergency. As I recall, I'm just like, I think Fida's first reaction to that is, oh no, because he knows that on the ships in the third horizon, those thrusters also generated the ship's gravity. <laughs> so he's like, up here seems to be okay, but down there might, something might be out of whack. Okay. This might be some kind of, you know, small, self-sustained thing, but down there might be something else. I'm starting to fill everybody in on, like, Tamarisk and Amara in on it as we're just on the bridge. And he's just like, look, Altain changed a bunch of stuff. He ripped out a bunch of systems. I don't know what he changed from base. So the good news is there is a central reactor to power everything. The bad news is it's offline. And um, we're going to have to get there. The ship has limited life support systems. So if we can scavenge ourselves some space suits, we might be okay. I'm going to check the bridge supplies. I don't know the layout of the ship well enough. And he's like, if you come over here, I can show you where, but it's not like on our periphery where I could take a 3D model and turn it and point, you know, zoom. Yeah, it's, it is what it is, Cap. We got to deal with it. All right. Well, let's get it done. What do you need me to do? Honestly, I think any minute now, fucking, fucking Mir's character is going to get here and we're just going to be like, uh, hey. You know, about that. For you, Cordelia, the ship is a little different than you remember the layout. Maybe it's just the cryo haze or whatever it is, but it takes you a little while to get to the bridge because you go down one corridor that you at least thought went to the lift, but there's no lift there. And there's no hull part there. There's no portion for you to walk through. There's no... It's like somebody took this part of the ship and cut it off. Are there any sorts of computer interfaces that are nearby that allow me to see what was done or any alterations that were made? They don't allow you to see the alterations, but they do give you like a new map that you could potentially upload to your HUD to be able to see. Maybe that's what it is. So she will take on her, she will take her helmet that was underneath her arm and put it on so that she is able to update this information into her suit. Okay. You update your suit and your stomach drops. You watch the long vessel, which Nadir was, shrink. Massive quad engines, enormous, long, sweeping hull, big, big, long, sort of rectangular ship, which at the front of it had four very distinct bulbs ahead of the main sort of cockpit, sort of bridge area that served as the front. And it's like you watch those wireframe portions wink out. And then that third bulb is what stays lit. And you see your geo position point as a little red dot. Like hundreds of kilometer of ship are gone. Oh, that's wow. And on that ship, would that have been a portion of area for pods and such as well? Probably some of them, yeah. The majority of that ship, though, was um, the interstellar, interstellar drives. It was probably also like raw resources, equipment, colonization. Everything to set up a new civilization out in space. Right. Huh. Mm. For half a moment, she lifts her hand so that she would communicate with the folks on the bridge and then lets it lower real quick. Not exactly eager to deliver too much bad news. Instead, she would try to see on the positioning, how far away she is from the bridge and what new way to navigate there. Oh, yeah, you got to turn around and go this way. Okay, that makes sense. You're not terribly far from it. Each of the bulbs had their own command center, but they were really just overgrown cockpits that were made originally to be mindful of like the cryo medical portion of them. You suppose they could be turned into a sort of bridge if they needed to, but it would take a lot of work. 
Along the way, as she goes, she's going to look to see what resources and what rooms still remain on this portion along the way. So along this portion, there are, you would, you'll be walking by the entrance to the medical facility, the big entrance to, that would lead to like the supply and or consumables lab, basically the lab you would end up using for, for food while you were here. Because to be clear, there are no replicators that, that matter to, uh, energy to matter stuff doesn't exist here for, for us. So no, no free rides. And then backup battery and then the core before a long, basically a long walk up a, a ladder and then a, a series of lifts that would get you to the bridge. All right. And the power situation, does it seem like as well as she would go, she would make her way up the ladder and towards the lifts with the power situation? Are the lifts active? They are not. You're going to have to climb the ladder. So with big, heavy, clonking steps along this metal ladder and echoing down the tube that goes towards the bulb, Cordelia starts to ascend towards the remaining bulb. On my way, I'd like just little... I'm on my way. Uh, had to redirect. There are some issues that I'm discovering with the ship. Not anything that I would get too worked up about right now. Uh, gotta find a little more info, but, uh, it's gonna take me a second. Hold on. You guys hear that across the bridge? Issues. Issues. Hmm. More issues. Love it. A few minutes pass, and then a sound begins to arrive outside, you think, one of the, one of the airlock doors that leads to the lower decks. And it's this consistent sort of metal on metal sound. And you've heard stuff like that before. You've heard someone climbing a ladder before in armor. And you got to give them one thing. There's a rhythm to it. I just kind of like, I wonder if you could set the armor to do the, you know, so that your muscles don't do the work. The armor just like does a macro. It just moves you. Little pistons do all the work. You kind of just trying to relax inside. Never wore the type of thing myself, so I don't really know. I wonder if it's like an exosuit. Kind of have to keep engaged with it. I instinctively reach for my pistol that's not there. It's not. Nope. Your pistol's not there. Not even the um, not even the memory of your gun belt exists. That's actually a great question as well, Keeper. Uh, do I have any of anything that is not attached to my suit? Oh yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you've, you've got built-in, like, you know, personal pistol, and then you have your standard issue Legionnaire rifle, which sits on your back. Here to help. The, the movement and the sound eventually slows down, and Cordelia, you reach the top of this tiny platform, which you would normally be stepping off a lift to get onto, and then there's the airlock doors. Cordelia takes a moment to look at the interface to see if they will open on their own. Oh, yeah, you should push this button. Click. So the bridge folks get to react to the slow sort of hydraulic <sighs> hiss of doors releasing. And you hear that sort of accordion grind as they slide apart. And what I'd like is for Mayor to explain what Lieutenant Colonel's power armor looks like. So stepping in through the airlock door is Cordelia. Her power armor is the first thing that you see. It is primarily black and white with edges that are lined with deep pink and neon blue. But even though this is a Legionnaire's standard power armor, it has a few modifications, a few personal touches, including some stickers and decals that range from some particularly touristy type style stops from across the system, different rabbit-like animals, and some things that actually just seem like doodles that were made with permanent marker. It's highly personalized. And as she steps through, she waves to you all. 
and then removes her helmet to reveal a woman who's in her late 20s standing in her suit. She is of a rather tall height, just a little over six feet, but you can see that the platforms on these boots are rather thick. So you would estimate she stands about 5'9". Out from the helmet is a head full of ash white blonde hair that's pretty thick, shaggy cut. It's darker at the roots. You can see at one point it was pulled back, but uh, is kind of falling out of how it had been pulled back. Some longer strands are escaping. Her skin color is a medium deep color um, with eyes that are like a golden honeycomb brown. And there before you, she stands upright and smiling. Nice. Hi there. Oh, and takes a moment, reactivates behind her helmet uh, with a hiss as it decompresses it. She takes it off and from underneath flows a rather messily braided white braid on a person who has olive golden olive tan skin dark brows and you can start to see where there was a white shock of hair the roots have started to come in and even now you can see that as cryosleep was initiated had some darker makeup around the under eyes flaring out towards her temples and some shockingly pink lips as in left the lipstick on did not wash her face before going into cryo ah hi is this uh is this everyone I step forward and extend my hand Amara ah Amara hi and sticks her hand her gloved hand forward and wraps it gently despite the size of the glove around Amara's hand Cordelia Oren, nice to meet you. Ooh, Amara, what do you look like? What, what do I look like? Uh, oh, <laughs> I mean, Cordelia's never met you before, so everybody should get a chance to sort of explain a little bit what they look like, especially in the current state that they're in. I don't think I had a chance to get to get in my skivvies before we got in the uh, the pods last time. It's five six, looks about one hundred and fifty pounds. She's you know slender. Inside of her. Um, left arm. You see some names there. You're obviously not sure who they are. She's got a, a crest of what you're also not sure of. <laughs> Upper left hand arm. And then down her back, which she's got a tank top on or a t-shirt, you can see some tattoos on her back if you um, if she, you, she were to turn around. They look like um, symbols. But again, not sure of what they are. And then on her right arm, she's got a, a um, planetary system tattooed on her right arm, which you may or may not recognize from from your previous travels. She's got pants on, leather pants, which feels really gross after getting out of the cryo. Um, so she's probably going to have to change that at some point. Yeah, she looks like she's in her early 30s. Her face looks friendly, but her eyes say, I'm judging you because I don't know you. Cordelia sees this apprehension but just smiles, says, hey, I like your decals. I got some too. And she gestures not to any visible tattoos, but to a number of stickers and decals that kind of look like tourist style stickers. Like I was here and all I got was this silly sticker details that are on there. And as well as like a couple of like rabbits, a couple of little like locations from little dive bars. So she's like, hey, I like it. And you are? And looks to the next person. <laughs> Tamarisk. Nice to meet you, I suppose. Sorry, we've just woken up. It's a little... Yeah. And you see I'm fairly tall, about almost six feet, wearing also wet clothes, but like a tunic with a high collar and trousers uh, plastered to my skin. Uh, So very tight, very wet, very uncomfortable, but I haven't really been paying much attention to it. Yes, eyebrow wiggle. 
and uh, I've got amber brown eyes uh, with very high angular uh, facial structure and a mass of brown wavy curly hair comes down just covers you can see there's a bit of a cut across one ear but I've moved my hair somewhat to cover most of it because it's very unsightly and my hair is kind of frizzy right now because of all the wet and the cryo issues going on you get the idea that this is someone who takes really good care of their appearance for the most part because they've tried I've tried to make myself look a little bit more presentable despite the situation uh, and sort of looking at you appraisingly just looking up and down not quite defensive body posture but very much a I'm not sure how to react in this situation so I'm going to be on my guard here until I know what's happening Cordelia looks at Tamarisk and is like, oh, nice to meet you. Uh, don't worry, my my hair's a mess too. And she reaches up with her giant glove, with her giant glove and like touches it. Can't feel any of it, but can just feel the tension there. Probably musses it up even further. Uh, we should all dry out soon. It'll all be fine. Um, but it's wonderful to meet you. Nice to meet you. And uh, finally? Like fight is nearly eye level with you he's like six and a half feet tall and he's just like I'm a fighter ship's mechanic well I guess not anymore but pleased to meet you legionnaire sorry lieutenant colonel I guess ah uh, yeah lieutenant colonel yeah and you just look at him and he is a big man with a long black curly beard, hair, skin color about the same as your own, that kind of olive Mediterranean complexion, that kind of those kind of dark hazel eyes, but like the hair is all curly and wet and just because of that, it holds the water longer. And you see that he's, it's just a big burly man that looks like he's used to hard work, indeterminate age, who's just, he's just looking at you. He's covered Every bit of skin you see is covered in intricate geometric patterns. And uh, it's under the hair as well. You can kind of see it going under the hairline for his beard and up under his for over his forehead. The hair is completely growing around them. He just looks kind of miserable <laughs> and just like de slightly defeated. But you also see that every now and then as you're looking at him, he's looking at you, mostly looking at your armor, and then his eyes are flicking away to look at, like, something else that seems to have caught his attention. Then he's back to you. He's just constantly like, oh, yeah, yeah. The head tilts away at 45 degrees. He, he clearly looks at something and then comes back. But yeah, he's just... He's wearing a black, basically, crossbody shirt. You know, the one type where the same seems on the center, it's down the side. Uh, there's no sleeves on it, so you see the full arms, and um, it looks like the whatever fit the shirt had is now ruined. So he's now um, he looks big and shapeless and dripping. Um, that would be the best way to describe fighter right now. I love it. He's just like, okay, look, everybody's just had a cryo, whatever. Do you prefer your rank or your name? Or because calling you Lieutenant Colonel is going to get old. Yeah, I I can understand that, and I don't see any of the other Legionnaires around, so we can just go with Cordelia for now, or Orin, whichever one you like. So, but you're an engineer or a mechanic, huh? Uh, uh, uh ships. Yeah, that's so helpful. I'm so excited because I have a couple of things in a little bit that you're going to want to see. He's kind of nodding. He's just kind of looking at the captain like, are you going to tell her? <laughs> looking at Tamrisk, are you going to? Which one of us is going to tell this lady who's very nice so far and hopefully won't flip her lid? Oh, yeah. And to be, to be clear, there is a linguistics like accent different between difference between the way Mare speaks, or Mare's hair speaks and the rest of you speak. Almost oldy English. Uh-huh. If no one else is going to say anything, he's going to be like, now, I don't know if um, there's a ship's uniform. We're, um, we're not original crew. 
there's a pause and he's just like, we'll fill you in on the details later. I think now is not the time for for the finer points, but we are uh, not original crew. There's a moment when Cordelia pauses hearing this. And even though her outward demeanor doesn't change, there's a little bit of a shift in her eyes because if these are not original crew and this ship looks like this right now, there very well could be an issue. Yeah, so you're very good about that. You're you're very good about sort of in that way being careful about what you reveal. That will absolutely be something that Fida and that Captain Kazra will not pick up on. Unfortunately for you, Cordelia, there is someone who is highly trained in the art of human, human pantomime in the room, and Tamaris makes this whole sort of, obs- you know, ob- obscuring of the truth that your face attempts to do and, and cuts immediately through it. So you can see, Tamaris, like the anxiety and the concern begin to grow on Cordelia's face. You know, even if she's not showing it, she's worried about something. You mentioned there were some issues with the ship. Anything we should be aware of so we don't die? I'm rather fond of living, personally. Okay. Um, Well, you guys are here in the major hub. Have you done any preliminary checks on the ship from where you are? Everything where I was was rather limited. Fida kind of directs her over. He's like, oh, over here. She sees this cobbled together interface that is not what she's used to. Yeah, and he's just like, now, I didn't build this. I would have done a slightly cleaner job, but it's serviceable for now. I'm not familiar enough with this design style or design period. Everything I worked on was like generations after this, so... I'm I'm sorry, what? You've been asleep for a very, very long time, Cordelia. What is the current year, then? That's a good question, Mike. What is the year? Mike, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to be... That's a great question. Ship query. Uh, time since initial launch. Okay, yeah, so time since the initial launch would be 260 years. Holy shit. I'm 287. You don't look a day over it. Thank you. But she sits there and is using her smeared makeup. Eyes slightly twitching. Uh, hmm. And, uh, do we know how long the ship, the, the trip was estimated to take? Because I'm guessing 260 years was not the estimation for us. Correct. You you believe that the trip was estimated to take roughly a hundred years, which is why you were going into cryo. Well, I guess we're a little past our expiration date then. <sighs> she looks at the mess of unidentifiable, incredibly foreign to her mechanical setup, the technological setup that's there, and looks to the old standard setup. And immediately moves towards that to see how badly this has been crosswired. Well, to be perfectly honest with you, given your technical experience of the age of the parts, what's been put together here on the ship is sort of a wonder. In effect, normally a ship like the Nadir would need multiple smaller command centers or smaller what we would call IDF spaces, right? So smaller spots, smaller rooms that control wiring and have controls that people sit at and then feedback information to a main central command center. What's been done, it looks like, is that this ship has been sort of remodeled around one of the bulbs and been given all of the same sort of controls that the command center would have in this big board at the middle uh, of the bridge. And so, well, it's a little amazing that this thing can do this. It would be like, in effect, taking a computer that was built in the 60s and 70s and then finding a way for it to somewhat flawlessly 
talk to, uh, be, be driven by a computer built in the 2020s, right? So it's it's something that you don't even know how this board would work because it's not based or built around anything you're used to. Yes, there is a quote interface portion like a keyboard, but it doesn't have, you're not used to any of these commands. Cordelia takes a moment to look through it. She does have a data jack built into her suit. Would she be able to use that? I assume on the older console, seeing as that would be the one that it would fit in. Yeah, you want to jack in? I would love to jack in. Okay. Yeah, so you spin up the the date the jack itself, right? You open the port, pull out a cord. This is something that everybody sees. Cordelia pulls a long, threaded, like thick data cable out of one of her forearms and plugs it in to the ship, uh, this this console here. And then her helmet begins to like light up with a bunch of different patterned text. And you see a bunch of stuff become superimposed inside her helmet. For you, Fida, this is a magical moment because a bunch of the machines that are in this room that have been desperate to be acknowledged, all of their alarms get acknowledged. Yeah, Fida lets out a visible sigh, like an audible sigh of relief. And even though she's concentrating, I don't know how much she pays, she pays but there's like a literal, a literal, oh, like that weight has been taken off. It's just like, oh, that's so much better. So for you, Cordelia, there's a, a series of things that get acknowledged about the ship. The ship has had, it has tra- traversed through an interstellar portal and you begin getting some sensory data from the outside of the vessel where you're at in the black. And that data is very minuscule. You are moving through space, so you're not at a complete dead stop. You are not moving very fast, but you are moving, likely through just momentum rather than actual under thrust. The core needs to come back online for you to be able to do a majority of the things that you need. And it looks like you're going to have to do that somewhat fast because the vessel's batteries are at critical at this point. They're, they have been drained down far enough where because the majority of the power is being kept in reserve for the cryopods that are still running you need to get the main power plant of the ship back up and going so that way it can come off batteries. You can see as Cordelia's focusing that the lights and stuff that seem to have just been like perhaps like a, a black or a white paint on their glow underneath with some deep pink, some neon blue. The cord that is attached into the interface also has like almost like an LED running light that goes through with it as well. And she just starts making a couple of mm-hmm, mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, sort of noises as she's thinking and formulating the steps of what would need to happen. After a moment, she would remove that helmet back off and go, okay, so a couple of things. Number one, we're moving. That's good. Apparently we went through a portal at some point. I was not the navigator on this. I'm just here to do my job. I'm just letting you know. We went through some kind of a portal. Cool, I guess. But here's a problem. The vessel right now is running entirely on its batteries, which are almost drained. We are almost at zero for those. So the core itself, the engine, everything is attached to the core. And we need to get that thing back online as soon as possible in order to preserve the lives of the colonists. Agreed. I promise that we'll fill you in on on the stuff between when you went in and now. We'll do our best. We don't know everything, but we, we'll tell you what we know. Priority one is going to be saving everybody on the ship, I guess, right? Because, I mean, this is the nadir, so, I mean... like, And you notice that the way he's talking about it, he thinks this is the entire ship. You can see that as talking about the colonists, there would have been a pretty significant shift in her voice too that is her biggest priority here and there is the clear and distinct thing of there is the fact that she's not telling about how much of the ship she knows is missing yet 
She just wants to get this core back online before going into a further investigation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he's just like, well, look, I mean, if you can... And he, like, brings up the map again of the ship, and he's like, Mike, can I see if there's any any spaces between here, here on the bridge and, well, what we've been calling the bridge and the actual reactor core that, um, any areas where there isn't life support. Yeah, so there are three significant areas where there is no life support. So, and this all makes sense to both you and likely Cordelia just by looking through the ship and understanding what it's got. So the, the main cargo space, right, that essentially where Cordelia, where your pod was nearby, that space, the space that sort of wraps around the ship, that portion doesn't have any life support in it. It's one of the first things to shut down because there's nothing living in there. It's all just cargo. And for the most part, it's not necessary for it to be, to have any any life support. The second portion is in and around the reactor area itself. And that's sort of a secondary fail safe where if it's on battery control to preserve the life of the colonists, it's going to take any potential power sources. It's going to take that power source away because it's going to divert it to the where the colonists' needs are. The third and more sort of difficult portion is, is that a section of this ship seems to rotate or it has been rotating. And that might be like an outer drum portion of it. For you, Fida, and really anybody who's somewhat familiar with ships, Older ships used a this sort of spin technology to generate gravity. And right now, the ship seemingly is still doing that, but it's hard to tell at how long that effect will continue to carry. And so you're, you're running into a couple of challenges here. One is you're going to have to get to the engine core itself to do whatever work is necessary to get it back online. There is no life support in that area right now, which means... Either Cordelia will have to do the work because likely her power armor is sealed and has an internal air tank, or you will have to find another suit, Fida. It, it might be good for you to look for suits for everybody just in case. Uh, the places that do have life support are the medical bay and the uh, medical cryo. So the space right out of medical, which is sort of like this bulb at the center, which is where all of the colonists are supposed to be being kept. Um, and then the, then the bridge and the um, air shafts and lift spaces that would be connecting those spots. I think between us, like we, we, we kind of map it out together. We're like, oh, yeah, we're going to be missing something here. And you might point stuff out to me because I'm not familiar with the design. I might point stuff out to you because I'm, I can see the work that's been done. And she would gather the others around, too, and point out the areas where there was some storage space, some equipment areas, the consumables area. It's like, well, before we try and get anywhere... We can see what's left here. I know there were a handful of other things on the equipment rack, but I'll be honest, I, I come in fresh out of cryo. I wasn't paying the closest attention to what materials we had. Yeah, and I don't know how much stuff was scavenged or stripped for weight. It was what? Uh, I'll explain to you later. We're not space pirates. He like looks at her in obvious fear and he's like, we aren't space pirates. For one thing, we'd have a ship nearby, which we'd be using to strip this ship with. Cordelia's look just continues to intensify, and she glances between the other two to see if either of them are going to either follow up or give the gig away. We're not space pirates. No. We were transporters of goods and services transporters of goods and services and were not originally crew members of this ship. Sounds like you three are going to be the ones going in and trying to fix the core. Let's find you some spacesuits. Yes. And she starts marching towards the ladder and starts marching towards and opens the door. She hears behind her fight a train to the tomb being like, look, Rakan will probably at least have our original suits on the ship. On the periphery which is in the cargo bay, which has no life support. We know those are there. And he's just like, it's going to be interesting introducing her to a fully cognizant AI, but that'll be, that's for later. Let's focus on finding suits 
We didn't escape the great dark just to asphy- asphyxiate on this seed ship. Yeah, sounds like a plan. Yeah, I'm at this point I'm just following him, you know. I'd like to tell the, the legionnaire not to tell me what to do. That she's not the boss of me or my crew, but we are in an unknown place in an unknown time. And she has a gun. And she knows the ship better than I do. And there's that. <laughs> At least she knows the ship systems better than I do. And she's able to talk to it. So many wonderful things that are going to happen. I just can't wait. So the three of you or four of you begin to head down towards the lower levels. So in these lower levels, you are able to locate a series of beneficial items. One, there are changes of clothes for each of you. So with the Lieutenant Colonel's help, you're able to locate clean, dry clothes, which is super helpful. Now, I got to admit, Tamaris, these are not what we would say culturally stylish. In fact, they're sort of bereft of any of that. You get put into what is effectively a gray jumper. It is not great for your overall fashion look. It is dry and clean. These are important things. I mean, maybe it's a little itchy. There's a very heavy sigh that I just can't quite prevent from escaping my lips as I put this thing on. Maybe a slight eye roll, you know, but I do it. I'm just not happy about it. It doesn't really compliment your figure. That's the problem. The problem is it's very boxy. It's like season one, next generation levels of just bad. We won't get into that, though. The second thing you find are a series of spacesuits, for lack of a better term. These are something that you could use in the zero, like a zero gravity environment. They have air tanks on the back of them. They are bulky. And I mean, as far as Cordelia is concerned, these are standard issue. Welcome to space. Here's the suit. Here's what you get. For you, Fida, these suits are like a couple generations behind in technology and don't get anywhere near anything sharp because you're going to be in trouble. Yeah, and she hears him talking about like, oh shit, they're not made with the... Oh fuck. So this was before they... <laughs> and like he's explaining to the others that it was before a certain polymer was made. Space suits were like very vulnerable. They weren't basically protected from micro meteors <laughs> like the way our, our suits would be and all the systems are huge. Look how big this backpack is. And he's just like, oh, look how big and bulky it is. Don't forget, don't go near sharp edges because <laughs> you'll die. Cordelia's sitting here hearing this and over the course of time just kind of puts both of her hands on her hips, just listening to it, which just makes the arms look huge as she's sitting there, tilts her head to the side. And is like, you could go in without it on. If you prefer. No, no, it's, it's better than nothing. It's just, and he's just kind of like, I'm in an interesting situation. This stuff is, I've seen it in museums. And she's having a moment while they're getting dressed. It's like, okay, so not pirates. How recently to getting out of cryo did you get into cryo? Like how much younger than me are you? She's sitting there trying to do the math, knowing that all of them look older, but she knows she's now officially got 200 years on them. When did you get on the ship? And she looks between all three of them. How long have you been on the ship? We got in just before the jump. When was the jump? We don't know. We we just woke up and the ship's gone to hell. One of us woke up beforehand. uh, The extra pod that you were probably noticed she's gone and joined some some kind of biocomputer on board and is the one that set your protocol to wake up so oh uh, what you know where that computer is it's in the medical bay it's meant to be used for like long range or like long term data imaging so they used it to effectively take certain memories right from those that were on board so that to create a a, a log of the lore of 
really the history of the planet. Ah. So she's a part of the ship now. Apparently. That, that's what she thought would happen. Yeah, we don't. I don't know enough about that kind of tech. I've never really seen it before. We just have AI now. So we're even back in the third horizon, I guess. Oh, by the way, welcome to the fourth horizon. Just put on your suit. <laughs> like every time he opens his mouth, he just says something else. that's just like, well, I mean, yeah, but I mean, obviously it's better than this. Cordelia just sits further back and waits for them to all get into their suits because she is absolutely not going to be someone going towards this reactor core at this rate and doesn't want them, like, has officially crossed the line into trusting less and less, but is being polite yet formal about it. Yeah, it's um, it's a rather interesting place for you to wake up and... It would certainly be nice if things would begin to normalize. But before any of that happens, getting down to the core is going to be a series of, we'll say, challenges. So if Cordelia's plan is to sort of stay back and let them get the core rebooted, when you get down towards that level, the core itself is basically, it's, it's an enormous power plant. And it has to be carefully brought back online and then powered back up. So for your perspective, Fida, this would be like bringing on, in effect, an old power station. And so there are an awful lot of checks and rechecks and people at multiple different positions to help get this thing jump started. And so what a little breakdown challenge wise is that this is a difficulty five challenge. So a difficulty five, with one person rolling against it, obviously, is 15 or higher. That is a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. That said, if you're going to have people assist you in in this challenge, you'll be able to remove one of those numbers. You'd be able to drop it from a 5 to a 4 based on the assistance of both Captain Kazra and then Tamaris. It'll have to be done in tandem because, obviously, you've got to worry about breakers and when when what portion is brought back online because you're not just messing with like a diesel generator for your you know dad's wood shop this is a serious power plant and if things go wrong well bad things happen when you do that in space if i did first thought and was like i wonder what the shielding is like he's like i'm sure it's fine they built these things to last Coriolis station probably has a few of these stowed away somewhere in the in those nooks and crannies yeah most likely to run to, to run, yeah, to run different portions of the station itself, sure. Yeah, so he's like, okay, in principle, this is the exact same as what I know, what I would have fixed and worked with myself. It's just older, and there's less automation involved. So I know the principle, I just need to communicate with everybody clearly. I'm looking at my character sheet, and to bring down the challenge rating, because I have the mechanical thing, I'm trained in all actions, identified our understanding machines, using repairing or crafting machines. So you'd be you'd be repairing a machine as part of this this challenge. Based purely on the the way it's written, the machine affinity comes from an affinity for electrical machines. And like because it says you were trained in tasks involving electrical machines. It sounds to me this is slightly more analog, but also, you know, it's like it seems to be writing that line. So I'm, I'm going to let you decide, Mike, if you think that would be a play. I'm going to say in this instance, because of the type of power cord is, it's not going to apply. Yeah, I was thinking that. Here. Um, As a part of my beneficent descriptor, I have the ability called Helpful. Whenever you help another character, that character gains the benefit as if you were trained in it, if you are not trained or specialized in the attempted task. So through whatever assistance, throughout realizing that this plan is actually going to have to have her involved instead of just standing by with the blaster rifle as she's used to doing, she says, okay, so you need these sorts of things here. Well, if you, I don't know what sort of technology you're used to but the basic elements are and she would explain kind of the chunks that she's got here and perhaps where she knows it is 
in an attempt to bring down the challenge rating on that by giving you now either trained or specialized in uh, the attempted task. I guess, that, Mike, that, would that take us from trained to specialized for it? So yeah, um, it's going to take a concert of people working on this at the same time. Yeah. What I'd like to know is what, how Tamarisk and, and Captain Kowser are going to help in this process, whether it's just going to be going to identified stations and making sure you're pulling levers and, and turning on machines when it's necessary, or is there some other way you would like to assist in getting this process started? I'm going to ask Fida to tell me exactly what levers to push or to buttons to push, levers to pull, what whatever, in what order, because I'm not great with machines, but I'm good at following orders. Ask very specific directions and then go look over at those specific areas and follow the instructions in my head. Get very detailed instructions. The way I kind of see this playing out would be that um, Cordelia and Fida are explaining things. Like Cordelia is more familiar with the, the actual layout of these devices and like what the design principle would be behind the, you know, how what it looks like. And oh yeah, of course this switch is here because you always put it next to, yeah, I wouldn't, of course it's that way. You know, she knows the design language in a way that I don't. I've worked with things built on it, but like I wouldn't be familiar with everything. And then between us, we can kind of explain, okay, I'm going to give three marks on my first mark. You do this switch. Then second mark, push this button. Third mark, this big, for some reason, strange uh, knife switch. One of those old Frankenstein like (laughs) knife lever switches. And you just pull this bad boy down. Then it arcs and uh, the system takes over. Yeah, it's somewhat like that. It's actually more of... It's probably a little bit more modern than, uh, than say... I love there being uh, an enormous, almost comedically enormous switch to this machine. So my question is, is if we're going to take it from a five to a four, mm-hmm. as far as the difficulty goes. Fighter, are you making this roll? I guess I am. Caster, do you have any skills that might assist us? Or perhaps special abilities? The special ability that I have that could probably help with this is there's your problem. So explain there's your problem for us. Trained in tests related to figuring out how to solve problems with multiple solutions. That's interesting. I don't know if it's permissible to apply multiple skills under one challenge. That's a power though, right? It's not like a you utilizing a trained skill. It's an actual power you have. Yeah, it's an enabler. So, oh, fabulous! I'll just let it ride. So, uh, we'll say that it's a difficulty three task now, with the four of you working together. And so, breaking that down, Mike, it's the it's Cordelia making my train my skill go from trained to specialist. It's and then Amara gives me the extra little boost there as well. So we, we knock one down because she's like, well, you know, if we just do this, it's like, oh, neat. Right. And then Tamarisk helps by making us explain it in a way that actually makes sense. <laughs> it's how I interpreted your description, Rena. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. She's totally, she's the, the person who makes the communication flow properly. Like, okay, you're not speaking the same technical language as fight is we both need everybody has to talk in the same language here otherwise we're all going to get screwed up they are your middleware right tamaris becomes the middleware portion for the group so that people can, can communicate properly now you can roll and hopefully not blow the whole ship and thus the season up well mike i got a 15. well you know what i like that so it takes a series of heroic tasks almost And that's more the physical portion of this because there's quite a bit of, uh, we'll just say calisthenics that have to go into pulling and pushing and, and, you know, getting around to portions of this power plant at the right time. So that way circuits can be pushed over, breakers can get flipped. But one by one, you're each forced to hold your breath a little bit in hopes that you've done your portion of the task correctly. And then two things happen that are a fair dead giveaway. The lights turn on 
in the engine bay, like the overheads, the big ones. Mm -hmm. And then you get, Cordelia, your helmet beeps because the main computer basically sends out a data signal to connect you to the ship. Like in the in the traditional formal fashion where like the ship's map could show you where you're at if people needed to contact you. Very similar to the way some ships can track GPS signals. We're in. And she says just kind of in the same way when she has the helm on um, and all of it beeps. Similar to how Fida was looking left and right her head kind of looks around as if in VR and is like seeing any of those little points and everything around, uh, seeing if anything else is red and beeping. Okay, that is a good sign. I like that. Good job. Is there anything else that we needed to do in here other than bring it online and power it up? Or is there a way for me to check, I guess, to see if the, that it has fully converted from using battery to using the generator itself? I mean, Fida should be able. The control panel over here should be able to show what what's doing it. As you're trying to do it th remotely, I'm doing it through the through the. Yeah, you're looking at everything, and I'm just like, I basically to me, it's all now background noise. T turning the ship over from batteries to main power happens as soon as main power is available. There are automatic, essentially PLC type functions that begin to happen as soon as something's available. So. All of the internal air and water and electricity for lights begins to switch over and the periphery comes alive again. And you begin to feel like the sense that there's something on the ship that's moving now. And the readout for you, Cordelia, is pretty, pretty immediate and that the outside wireframe of the ship shows that that middle portion of it is beginning to circle again, which is good. I think because of the way the comms work, like... Once we get the feedback saying, like, the gravity center has come on, he's just, but you do hear fighter action. He hasn't relaxed till now. Just a, oh, thank God. Thank the idols. The who? Cordelia, who did he just thank? The what? What idols? Icons. Icons. He's, he's like, yeah, I mean, you can call them both. I mean, the icons is the proper name, but, you know, he's just like, you know, like, the gambler, the and he's he's like looking at you and like Is this like tarot cards? Like we were still big into tarot and crystals and stuff. Like that was still Uh uh-huh, uh uh-huh. And he like claps his hands together, but in space in a s in a room without life support and in these big heavy gloves, and he's just like, Well, things were different in the third horizon. Again, once we get I'll make all these systems pinned down. I will explain as much as I can. And I'm sure that we can now query your computer and it'll tell you all sorts of things because Kynath's part of it now. And she knew a lot of stuff. Right. Okay, then. Well, yeah, I, I, I think now that life support's on, now that we've got power going to things, now that all of this is happening, I think we do all need to sit down and have a pretty significant talk. Yeah. And he like turns to him out. He's like, I think we should do it aboard uh, the periphery. The other one? The other periphery. <laughs> the what? The smaller one. Yeah. Our periphery. We have a ship that coincidentally was also named the periphery before we found this periphery. And it's in your cargo bay at the moment. This is the Nadir. Originally, Yes. So are you telling me that you, as not pirates, have renamed a ship that is not yours? We didn't rename it. The guy who renamed it is dead. I will say that. So not pirates are responsible for a dead guy who named a ship that is not his or yours. That's full of colonists that have no idea what's going on right now and are in all of our hands. Just, I know that's probably just a summary of things right now, but is that roughly where this stands? I mean, it's a simplification, but it is correct. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm gonna need y'all to start making your way down the hallway at this time, thank you. I love this, uh, I love the idea of this conversation taking place on the periphery. 
the other periphery, as it were. I love the idea of it so much so that I'd love to do it the next time we get together. So the, well, the ship has power again fully, and so that's progress. But it seems like there are some, we'll just say, nagging little details, just tiny things that need to be sorted out. Well, you mean like the food problem? Yeah, maybe. Uh, Amongst others, we'll talk about all of them on the next episode. So uh, thank you for joining us for this episode of Children of the Periphery, our season two into the unknown using Monaco Game Cipher System. We hope you have enjoyed the story so far and uh, we can't wait for you to experience even more. So thanks and have a good night.